Thank you for joining us with Ask a Historian. I'm Matthew Wilkinson, historian with Heritage Mississauga. And each week we invite you to send in your questions and we'll explore the stories of the city of Mississauga together. Like, subscribe and follow us and stay up to date on all the heritage happenings with Heritage Mississauga. Joining us this week for Ask a Historian is Jesse DeJager, who is the manager of capital projects with Credit Valley Conservation Authority. And we're here to explore an exciting development. And, and yes, I know Credit Valley is broader than just Mississauga, but it's in Mississauga. Uh, and that is uh, the Jim Tovey uh, Lakeview Conservation Area, the newly developing uh, conservation area, uh, soon to be, uh, uh, I don't know, the gem of the waterfront in Mississauga, perhaps. But uh, uh, Jesse, this is uh, in your under your purview and under your passion here, and I'm just wondering, uh, thank you for joining us here at Ask a Historian. Well, thanks for having me, Matthew. I am very excited to talk about this. This is exciting, and also to share with you know people that are interested in heritage and Mississauga. I think there's a lot of interesting connections that we can talk about today. I, I'm I'm excited to explore it. It's not often we get a chance to explore the topic of of new natural heritage. Is that that a, it, it's kind of an oxymoron in a bit, but I, I think I think it aptly applies to what you're developing here. But um, can you, in, in basic terms, I I mean I know of it. I know of it largely through a presentation I saw that you gave uh, a few uh, like a month and a half or two months ago. Uh, but uh, we've heard about it over over time. Uh, particularly the late Jim Tovey uh, was a champion of it. But could you tell us? what the Jim Covey uh, Lakeview Conservation Area is. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, formerly known as the Lakeview Waterfront Connection as a project, it's now known as Jim Tovey Lakeview Conservation Area. As you say, it's a brand new conservation area being built on the shoreline of Mississauga uh, between Etobicoke Creek, generally Marie Curtis Park, over to the Lakeview Lands, which is the former uh, coal generating station area. So in that area, in kind of the southeast portion of Mississauga, it's a new 26 hectare green space that's being built uh, through partnership with CVC and Toronto Region Conservation Authority and the region of Peel. So this is kind of a new development. So what we're doing is we're creating uh, a new landform through uh, reusing fill, regional fill material, to create a new landform that's given entirely over to conservation uh, purposes and provides a new connection for people on the shoreline, active transportation. And uh, it's set to become one of the, the busiest and largest conservation areas uh, CVC has, and certainly one of the most significant green spaces in the city of Mississauga. I, I, to me, I think it's absolutely a brilliant idea in that, you know, we're, you're opening up a waterfront that really has never been open to the public. I mean, this is, uh, you know, an exceptional opportunity all around na for nature, for people, for, again, active transportation corridors and just the, that access to the waterfront. Like, ha it, it, it's a construction project, right? Like, the, the, this is something that's being built where something wasn't wasn't before. So can you tell us a little bit about how the construction construction of the conservation area is is happening how, how, how it's been being developed yeah absolutely so yeah as you say there's nothing there now it's kind of the the shoreline that exists uh in that area uh, that was kind of altered through previous history um you know through industrial uses and other park uses <clears throat> but the conservation area is being created kind of on the bed of lake ontario through filling in uh through uh containment cells uh using regional material, mostly region appeal excess material from infrastructure projects like we do like linear like pipe and, and wastewater projects. So a lot of that material that comes out of the ground that's normally trucked away to waste sites, we're treating it as a resource, as sort of a circular economy idea. So all of those uh, trucks that would be going out to dump the fill out uh, elsewhere are being brought down to this site. And how it's being constructed is we use a series of containment berms. So these are berms that are kind of filled out as we go out into the lake to create a cell, what we call a cell. There's eight different cells that we've created through this project. And so the material for that is concrete and rubble, inert, uh, clean material. And we create kind of a road that, that, that equipment and trucks can drive on. And we tie that back off. And then we electrofish and then we try to get all the rescue, the things that might be in that cell. And then during the periods of the year where, um, you know, during the cold water windows where we don't want sediment and stuff going into the lake, we can then backfill 
into those containment areas so they're contained. And then we uh, go in kind of a cellular pattern. So we kind of grow the conservation area cell by cell by cell. So we started in 2015 with the first shovel, uh, sorry, November 2016 uh, is this first shovel in the lake. And uh, we've tied off our final cell uh, last year. And so right now we, we've imported about 80% of the material. So we have the fill, we have a cap material and then topsoil that goes on. And then as the cells get um, filled, we do restoration. So we do planting of our trees and shrubs, our meadow grasses, and we shape the wetlands that are there supposed to be on site and we plant those with aquatic species. So we're progressively restoring the site uh, as we go. Um, using a combination of uh, those materials. So we're literally creating land, a new landform on Lake Ontario and uh, kind of a new shoreline on the, on the Great Lakes. The, the whole process in a way is, is baffling for someone who knows nothing about it. It, it just, this idea of creating land, but uh, doing it in so uh, such a systematic way in which it, it I, I guess, allows you to do it in a protective sense because Lake Ontario is still an active body of water, right? Like, so you're, you're yeah. dealing with the, with elements that are probably not wanting to be intruded upon. So it's... Well, we've learned lessons, right? So, you know, an example project, uh, I guess comparable, but earlier was Tommy Thompson Park, right? The Les Leslie Street Spit, where that's a lot of just refuse fill material that goes out into the lake. And, you know, the big term for that part is accidental wilderness. It was never really planned to be this big park. It was kind of, you know, a place to deposit all of this rubble and material and fill from City of Toronto development. And a lot of that happens in uncontained filling. So that's like just lake-based filling where a truck will drive up and, you know, dump the brick and rubble and it goes there. And there is sediment matters associated with that that aren't great and so the lesson learned for this project which we've incorporated as best practice is that by using containment cells we minimize you know the amount of sediment release and turbidity so we protect the fishery and we keep all those materials contained so it, it's really a um, an evolution of like you know it's not always a great idea to fill a great lake but if you're going to do it you should do it for good purposes and you got to do it the right way I, I, there's something poetic in the on the website, and we'll share the links uh, here as well. But uh, you have uh, a, a neat kind of uh, not only a testimony to what's being done, but a, a, an examples of the processes as well. Uh, a lot of the fill that was uh, broken up concrete from the coal generation uh, plant that was there, coal firing plant that was there, uh, was has been recycled into this this park development. I think there, there's a, a fascinating a conversation there around regeneration of a natural landscape from an industrial past. <laughs> oh yeah, hundred percent. That's a huge um, win for everybody. I think, you know, the coal generation plant has a legacy in that community. And, you know, it was obviously a big change and a big win to see those lands uh, used for different purposes, return to the community to have development. But all of that concrete that went into the pad of that plant, you could imagine, all of it beneath all those big turbines, there was a lot there. And that's a lot of embedded carbon, right? So it was a great win working with the Lakeview Community Partners who are developing the, the lands now. And what we did is we built a road between the two sites, just directly for our trucks. And the Lakeview Partners worked on, you know, demolishing uh, all of the former generating station pads. And the rock trucks would just bring it directly over to, to the Jim Toby site. And we'd use that to build the containment cells. And that accelerated the project um, massively. We could continue the, the construction of those berms faster, which is great for the project, great for the public. And it's a win for you know, climate change. It's a win for the economy. It's a win for both, of, um, both partners in this, uh, that we can just use that old industrial past and create something uh, new out of it that's actually contributing to the restoration of the Great Lakes. I, I, th I think one of the, the neat, that, that's, to me, that's one of the most, I, I don't know if poetic's the right word, but I, I it, it's one of the, the Oh, neatest. there's poetry there, yeah. 
um, but you, you also have, I, I mean, in a way, you're also repairing uh, damage that is, you know, s- centuries ago or a century ago from uh, the the uh, the stone hooking trade that you know, kind of shed the the shoreline of its natural uh, natural shale protection. Um, mm. And I'm just wondering, like, with the the development that's going on, the plans around kind of connecting to the heritage of the site, uh, incorporating it into the into the plan for the site. Again, we celebrate this locally the story of stone hooking, but we also know it had a detrimental effect, uh, to say the least, upon shorelines and natural habitats. Can you talk about kind of that, that connection between history and this uh, awareness of, of our past versus what we're trying to do today? Does that make sense? <laughs> yeah, no, there there are big connections. Yeah, not only just the, the, the concrete, but, you know, how we're trying to create a new a new shoreline so yeah as you mentioned the stone hooking you know um denuded the near shore of of all of the uh, stone that you know fish use for shoals and for spawning and also you know contributes to erosion so and all the the cobble beach system all those cobble beaches were picked clean for building material and concrete and, and other purposes too so yeah what we're doing to kind of recognize and repair some of that historical stuff is is you know putting that stone back into the the near shore so we're creating fish habitat through putting you know those kind of revetment stone and other boulders uh, below the the water level down on the bed of the lake and creating those fish spawning fish habitats that uh, were totally lost it's now you know protecting the shoreline uh, quite a bit better and and you know providing long term stability there so that's that's kind of a cyclical nature of stone out, stone in, repair repair the 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 heritage of of the area. The other big one I think too is um, the wetland creation that we're doing. So some of the in- industrialization, more related to kind of residential development, actually is you know with Mary Curtis Park and Etobicoke Creek that area having um, seen all those former uses down there. There was a, there was a great wetland complex kind of at a back shore area of Etobicoke Creek. And that was kind of where the small arms manufacturing facility was, where the artillery range, where they'd shoot, you know, a thousand yards out of the lake. All of that, um, you know, some of that still exists in terms of the the, uh, the range there. But, you know, when Etobicoke Creek um, uh, experienced Hurricane Hazel in 1954, wiped out a lot of the, the, the cottages and human occupation of that area. We lost the... Um, a lot of, you know, the, the valuable resources down there for, uh, ecologically. And so what happened is they, they straightened the, the creek, you know, to prevent flooding. But it means we totally lost our coastal wetlands. And coastal wetlands are, are completely, almost have disappeared uh, from a lot of areas of the North Shore of Lake Ontario. And so a big part of this is building new coastal wetlands back into it. And, uh, and that's what our Searson Creek wetlands are and our Applewood Creek wetlands are coastal wetlands that go up and down with lake levels and provide all that habitat that was completely lost through the um, the modifications to Topico Creek. And the only one I think is a really important uh, kind of cyclical industrial um, uh, nature is Searson Creek was entirely uh, cre- uh, buried under, you know, the uh, GE Booth treatment plant and it was, uh, you know, piped in different areas. And so the big project here is working with the partners on their land and us. We have a new extension of Searson Creek and it's now completely uh, daylighted. So it's kind of writing that wrong where it was seen as Searson Creek was, ah, this is an issue for the the plant. Now it's back to being its own creek again and, and it has connectivity to the lake and fish can make it up the stream for the first time in, you know, almost 70 years. So it's kind of a a nice fixing the industrial past with uh, with kind of the old technology, which is natural restoration. I, I was going to ask about Searson Creek because I think that's just a wonderful. We have, we have pictures of uh, you know historic pictures of people fishing or bathing in, in Searson's Creek, and uh, you know that landscape was altered, and you can no longer even place kind of those images of that. Again, the, the, the it's the forgotten creek in a way. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's oh, like yeah. Mine. Uh, so the fact that we're you're bringing it back uh, and kind of as you said daylighting it's not a term I'd, I'd thought of before but you know opening it back up I, just a wonderful way to kind of have the the environment kind of come through again and I guess raise its importance on our on our landscape in terms of you know this should not have been re- rerouted and buried <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah absolutely we've done a lot of things 
you know, that were expedient for, for, you know, commercial industrial development. And, you know, it's kind of rethinking what's important and, you know, doing development correctly, right? Like we can, we can have new communities like Lakeview Village that are coming online, but we can also have uh, the creeks come back. You know, we can have these wetlands come back. We can have both. And actually you need them, right? Like it's, it's tied to your human health, and our and our success as uh, you know as a civilization so it's really cool to have those kind of full circle stories come back you know within within that century span i i think it's it's a it's a wonderful uh kind of connection or or a, maybe even bookend idea we have a massive amount of, of developments happening along the lakeshore corridor like we have lakeshore village project we've got uh things happening in port credit you know there's going to be a whole lot of new people coming to this this the southern mississauga community and yet at the same time in the midst of this kind of development wave um we're developing a significant natural area as well and i and i think you know uh, there's a, never a bad time for it but it's definitely a good time for it <laughs> <laughs> well absolutely i i think i think people are hungry for it right and yeah. and i think it's i think we've enjoyed the project it generally has enjoyed really good public support because of course, it makes sense to people, both on paper, financially, and and but also like intellectually and something spiritually about it too. Like, yes, it makes sense. We need to do this. We need to correct the issues and make it right for the next generation. And that's kind of what this is. It's like a generational project. A project like this doesn't come along uh, very often. You know, it's uh, it's quite it's quite special that way. Yeah. Well, you referenced the lessons learned at the Leslie Street Spit in Toronto, and when did that begin? That was in the in the seventies, I think. So, uh, I mean, it, it's you're right. These, especially the waterfront sites, don't come around very often, right? Like it's, it's those are prime real estate in that sense. Um, yeah. When I mean, this, this is absolutely exciting, and I'm sure people are are they want to go beyond the imagery and actually see it themselves. When when will it open? Do you anticipate for for public use, public connection? Yeah, we are on track for uh, 2025 completion and opening. So it's a long haul project. I mean, we started in 2010 with some early feasibility thinking and studies in the EA construction 2016. So this is a kind of a generational construction project as well. But yeah, I, I'm happy to report that we're on track for 2025 uh, uh, opening and that will coincide uh, ideally with some of the development at Lakeview Village as well. So right. not only will we have a connection on Recurse Park that people can use to access the site, but hopefully a connection at Lakeview Village as well in 2025. So that's coming up quick. You know, yeah. we're less than three years away at this point. So given your long association for this come 2025, what are you doing next? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not quite at retirement age yet, Matthew, but, but yeah, I think a lot of people connected with the project and it's a big team. I'm, I'm here today representing kind of a, a large project team from TRC and, and Peel and obviously CVC. And there's a lot of people who feel very connected with this, have spent a big part of their careers working on it and feel very connected to it. So I think we'll, we'll probably go through a grieving process after 2025, like, ah, oh, man, we're not going to have another one like this, but uh there's, yeah. a, there's always work to do. There's more restoration yeah. to happen. And uh, and yeah, and I will note too, is that even when we open in 2025, um, the place is not done and set. This is a, a bit of an experiment in ecological restoration where this is going to require a lot of monitoring uh, and adaption in our management approaches. We have these forests that are going to mature over time that are going to require some sort of successional intervention these wetlands that'll have to mature grasslands so these are habitats which require you know some modifications changes over time and then we have the influx of people right people are going to be here enjoying it which they should we want people to get there you know we expect maybe up to four million visitations per year by you know 2045 so it's going to be very popular so managing these large habitats in the context of high visitation is going to be a, a ongoing issue. So, yeah, we're not going anywhere. It'll be open to 2025, but, you know, there's still lots of... The, the, the stewardship just begins in 2025, right? That's the... Exactly. <laughs> yeah. 
Well, no, I, you know, for one, I, I look forward to it and, and just to, to see this uh, engagement with the waterfront that we've never had in, in a completely new space, reclaiming that kind of natural landscape and the, the natural area is just phenomenal. Um, can you speak briefly on, um, I, I guess, the, the, the ideas behind that brought this to life? And I'm thinking uh, the, the, inspi insp the inspiration or the driving force that was the late Jim Tovey, Councillor of uh, Long, Long uh, or serving counselor of Ward One who, who passed away, but this was this was a, a baby of his, if you will, in, in the sense where he was, he, he was driving force, a spokesman for it. And I'm just wondering if you can talk about the ideas. You talked about 2010 as feasibility studies, but uh, you know it, it's a long road to get the shovels in the ground. And uh, just, just wondering if you can touch on a little bit of that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah there there was a there was a lot of there's been okay, three main things that were kind of going on at the time that kind of brought this idea together as a potential solution for a number of problems. So yeah, I'd say back in 2010, you know, when the, the ideas first started percolating, uh, the community itself was looking for um, a future that was different than the power plant. Obviously things were um, still up in the air about how the province was gonna use the land. And, you know, Lakeview community had been looking at um, what the future could look like. How do you get the lake view back in lake view? You know, how do you get people back to shoreline? People have been disconnected by, you know, the, you know, the water treatment plant or the, or the coal plant. So how do you get people back there? What's a, what's a vision that we can, uh, you know, have for, for a different future for lake view. So that was kind of going on. Jim was involved with that, John Danahy, others that were, that were present. So that was in the air. Um, secondly, you know, Credit Valley Conservation was embarking on our integrated shoreline study. And that's um, kind of looking at the shoreline of Lake Ontario in our jurisdiction between Etobicoke Creek and kind of Oakville. And so the Mississauga shoreline, what was going on on the shoreline and near shore, like two kilometers up. And we were seeing a lot of things and particularly to this area, a lot of things. So I mentioned the fisheries issue that there was no great fishery habitat anymore. There was no east-west connections was a habitat corridor, right? These were kind of industry right to the shoreline. Yeah. And then there was no stopover habitat for migrating birds and insects. They, they don't, they, they'll use what's available, marginal stuff, backyard trees, the odd park, but you know, there was a, a severe lack of migratory stopover. So we needed to create these spaces and no coastal wetlands, as I mentioned, right? So we lost that. We had Rattray, but we, you know, there was something here at Etobicoke that was gone. So we like, we need to recreate habitats that are lost. So that's what we, the CBC was looking at. And then that third piece, which makes this all possible, is the region appeal, like I say, was generating a lot of additional fill for its infrastructure projects and paying a premium to ship some of this stuff up to Barrie or down to Cayuga. And that's a lot of trucks on the roads, a lot of impact for communities, it's a lot of GHG emissions. So, you know, what is there a better use of that fill locally? And so it was the, uh, you know, coalescing of those ideas. And Jim was essential in kind of pulling that sitting on regional council in the sitting on our board, sitting on, um, uh, you know, the community board and saw these pieces and started pulling people together, like, what's the win, win, win here? And so that's what coalesced into this project is like, yes, we, we got a better use for fill. We can create a new conservation area. And yeah, we, it's going to be, it's going to be cost saving uh, to the region. It's going to be better for the community. And, you know, it's going to address all our historical, ecological issues. And so Jim was a very big driving force behind pulling those threads together and and you know, kind of the big project sponsor. So when he passed away uh, tragically in 2018, uh, too young. I mean, it, it made a lot of sense for the CBC board and, and Mississauga Council to name this project after him. And we think it's a great legacy. I think it really Absolutely. speaks to uh, to you know the big generational movement that that was afoot in Lakeview. I I, I just. For, for myself as a Mississauga resident, but somebody who knew and worked with Jim as well, to see this, uh, this, this, this idea come to fruition. And again, thanks to all the partners involved, not uh, led I know by, by CVC and, and uh, yourself and your team, but, but everyone else who's at the table working on this. I mean, what a, like you said, a generational project and uh, they don't come around very often. And so to see this in development and to, you know you know to you know looking forward a couple of years from now when it's actually open and and engaging with the, we're able to engage with the space uh, what mm -hmm. what an exciting uh, exciting thing to develop within our midst oh yeah and Mississauga residents should be absolutely super proud 
and I think they will be when they get there and they, they can see this and get their hands in it and get their feet in the water. Yeah. Um, but like this, you know, this is an absolutely unique project on the Great Lakes. Nothing like this is happening in the entire Great Lakes system. This is something of this scale for this purpose, like giving it entirely over to conservation purposes. Um, it doesn't happen very often. In fact, it doesn't happen anywhere else. So, I mean, Mississauga is going to have a, a massive new legacy in this project. Well, thank you so much for spending some time with us here. And uh, uh, we lo we, we'll, we'll watch it with anticipation and excitement moving forward. And, uh, you know, in, in the in the in the mon months and years ahead, uh, it's scary to say that, but uh, we'll, <laughs> we'll revisit this and explore where things are at and, and how, how the project's coming. But uh, uh, Jesse, thank you so much for spending some time with us here. Absolutely. My pleasure, Matthew. It's been great to talk about it. And like I said, look forward to kind of maybe circling back when we're closer to opening. And, yep. you know, there's going to be a lot of uh, interesting stories to, to tell on site and invite people into that kind of maybe, uh, maybe history. We can, maybe we can do a live episode down there. <laughs> <laughs> from site report from site i love there it. we go there we go so uh with that i, I just uh, thank you to everyone for joining us on another episode of ask the historian uh keep sending in your questions to explore different stories of the city of mississauga each and every week here um and thank you again to uh, jesse de jagger who is uh the again the manager of capital projects with the credit valley conservation authority uh and exploring the exciting developments of the jim tovey uh, lakeview conservation area development and so with that uh we will see you next week on Ask a Historian and thank you once again, Jesse. Yeah, thank you.